Good evening, and welcome again to Public Perspective. I'm your host, Kevin McDermott. And tonight, we'll be de delving deep into science, interesting science, the kind of science done at Fermilab, or more uh, completely, the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory. Right? So my guests, Dr. Kurt Rieselman and Andres Alves, welcome. So good to have you here on the show. Thank you for having us. It's Thanks great. for having us. Uh, well, let's start with basic things, like uh, what is an accelerator, and why do we need a lab to accelerate things. <laughs> so uh, Fermilab is a U.S. Department of Energy national laboratory. There are 17 of them. Um, we are the only one that does uh, us, uh, just one thing, and the one thing that we do is called particle physics. So we build two different types of things at Fermilab. We build accelerators, which are big machines that take tiny subatomic particles and get them up faster and faster to about the speed of light and then either ram them into each other or ram them into a target and make other particles that we want to study. And then we build things called detectors, which help us detect those very tiny invisible particles. But then when you say you build accelerators, it's not like you're... There's an assembly line where you're building these things and selling them to other countries. Oh, no. No, you right. build them and they stay put. They stay where they are. Yeah, yeah. we use them for our research. Yeah, and then um, there are 1,790 employees at Fermilab, but um, something like, what is it, 4,000 um, users from around the world, um, people in different countries who come to help us on our experiments. So they come to us because we have the big accelerators and the big detectors at Fermilab. And in fact, there are not many accelerators in the world. Is that true? There's... Uh Fermilab um, and the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland? For the larger ones, absolutely. Yeah. The Large Hadron Collider at CERN is the largest particle collider in the world. Um, Fermilab had that honor for about 25 years. We ran a machine called the Tevatron, which is basically the Large Hadron Collider, but much smaller and less powerful. The not so large <laughs> Hadron Collider. Right, right. The, the small Hadron Collider, right. yes. <laughs> so, um, uh, and now we, we uh, operate one of the largest uh, particle accelerators in the world still. Uh, it's called the Main Injector. It's about two miles around around and we use it to create a beam of a particle called neutrinos. Um, but you're right, there aren't very many of these very large accelerators in the there, world. There's one at Stanford, right? There's Stanford, mm -hmm. but it's a linear accelerator, it's a linear not accelerator. a circle, right? And, and overall, there are about 30,000 particle accelerators in operation around the world. 30,000? Mm -hmm. 30,000. Small ones. But as, as Andre said, the large ones, mm -hmm. uh, maybe a dozen or something like that, uh, many of the other particle accelerators are used in industry, in, in hospitals, in, in uh, material science. So, now so there are many, many applications to uh, destroy cancer cells, to, to do diagnostics, to improve materials. So there are many applications, but for the fundamental science these days, we need particle accelerators that are very large. And that is actually the reason why Fermilab was created, mm -hmm. be because a single university or a research laboratory, a small one, couldn't do it. So the government created, and not just in the United States, but also in Switzerland and other places, in Japan, governments created these big research facilities with these gigantic particle accelerators. And then scientists from all over the world, from universities around the country and so on, would go to these places to use them for their research. Uh, now, this is also referred to, I, I believe, as high energy physics. Mm -hmm. Correct. Right? And is that part of why these accelerators have to be big? Because you can generate enough energy to make these collisions happen at higher and higher speeds? Is that the basic idea? That's exactly right, yeah. yeah. So the uh, uh, sort of as a rule of thumb, the, the smaller the thing that you want to find, the bigger the thing you have to build to find it. <laughs> <laughs> and, okay. Yeah, and uh, so that's, I mean, the, uh, the Large Hadron Collider was built at the size that it is so that it could generate the energy it does, uh, essentially to find the Higgs boson and any other particles that it may come out of the collisions that, that we couldn't find at, small, at lower energies. So one of the things, I, I mean, I, I'm not a scientist, but mm -hmm. I do read this stuff just because I'm weird like that. <laughs> um, one of the things I've wondered about is that when these particles are created in these high energy collisions, uh, does this happen in the natural universe as well? I mean, because it takes such high energy to create these particles. They don't, appear, apparently, I would guess, they don't just happen naturally like on, the, on Earth. You know, the Higgs boson doesn't just appear on Earth because you can only create it in these high energy collisions. So are they out there or are we just kind of making them up? They are actually out there. The, the problem is you need these gigantic particle detectors to then uh, take photos and, and study images of the, the Higgs boson or mm -hmm. something like that. Uh, in the universe, these collisions happen in Earth's atmosphere, for example. And, and there are some collisions that are 
much, much, much more powerful than we can generate here on Earth with our machines. The problem is you don't know where in the sky the particles hit mm -hmm. and so on. And moving these gigantic particle detectors <laughs> around, it's yeah, just yeah. a catch one, <laughs> right. catch one. Right. Yeah. It's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, right, right. OK. Um, but if you could, for example, I, I don't know, be, uh, put a detector near a supernova, you might be able to seek some of these reactions. Is that the and, kind of thing? And that is actually something that people have been successfully doing here on Earth. We, we can catch signals from supernova, mm -hmm. from exploding stars mm -hmm. uh, in the universe here on Earth. We, we've seen the light of supernovas, and there has been one incident where particle detectors could even see neutrinos coming from, mm -hmm. from supernova. And that is actually one of the ongoing research areas at Fermilab, where we want to do that more and learn more about supernovas in the universe. Well, before we get to supernovas or neutrinos, we're talking about the, the lab itself. We have some photos of, of the lab, don't we? So I think yeah. it's interesting to see just what these particle accelerators look like from, from the air. Sure. Because you can get a sense for the, the size of, of, of what we're talking about, right? Yeah. Um, because it's a, a major construction project, right? Just, just to build these things oh, takes absolutely. years. Yes. Right? Absolutely. How long did it take to, to build the main ring? It was... Uh, probably two, three years, mm -hmm. something like that, and, and that is so relatively fast. The Large mm -hmm. Hadron Collider, I think that was more like five years yeah. uh, to construct it. Yeah, um, yeah that's an image. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That, so that's what you're looking at there is the, uh, the iconic central building of our laboratory. That's Wilson Hall. It's named after our first director, Robert Wilson, who was uh, not only a, uh, a brilliant physicist, but a sculptor and an artist. So almost ah. everything that looks like art on our site is Robert Wilson. Did he, he uh, help design that building? He did help design that okay. building, yes. Right. Yeah. It's actually based off of a cathedral in France that he really liked. So ah. the inside of it is entirely open. It's an open air atrium that goes up 16 ah. stories. It's so the, the windows you see on the edge there, that goes all the way up to the top. Yeah, yeah. and so this is, uh, this is an aerial view of the whole site. The site is 6,800 acres, and these are the large uh, accelerators that we were mm -hmm. talking about. The one that's in the foreground is the one that we use uh, now to create our, our beam of particles that we study. It's called the main injector, and uh, the actual accelerator is about 30 feet under where we're uh, under the, uh, mm -hmm. the, the ring that you see there. Um, but the rings are large enough you can see them from the air as you're coming sure. in to, to midway. You know, it's, uh, so most of the site actually is undeveloped. It's, uh, there's a mm. thousand acres of uh, restored tall grass prairie that we have a, uh, a great um, not-for-profit organization. That's no big deal. I have tall grass prairie in my backyard. Right. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just well, don't take care of it, and there it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you don't have the particle accelerator. Right. I don't have one. Yeah. Particle. So <laughs> no, this, no, you're right. this is the accelerator. This is what it looks like inside. Um, so uh, the... Um, the accelerator uh, is, as I said, 30 feet underneath the ring, and it's basically just a ring of magnets, mm -hmm. just very powerful magnets that uh, um, will uh, accelerate and then focus the beam of particles and getting it to just about the speed of light before we manipulate it in some way to do what we want uh, with it. So. Does it uh, before we leave that photo, does it... Yeah, um, we should probably... Yeah. When, you're, um, when you're accelerating these things, mm -hmm. does it take many circuits? Um, like you just accelerate it once around and it hits top speed, or do oh you have no. to yeah. run it around ten many thousands times. of times? Yeah. So, so uh, but the particles quickly get closer and closer to the speed of light. So, when such a ring is only in our case two miles circumference, mm -hmm. so you can calculate how many ten thousands of times the uh, particle can go around and in, in just a, a second. Today. Yeah. So, um, and and every time a particle goes around, it gets a little kick by, by the, uh, the, magnets. the yeah. electric field and, mm -hmm. and then the magnets going around and it picks up energy mm -hmm. and that's how we bring the particles to higher, higher energy and that, that's what we talked about. Mm -hmm. These are the high energy right. experiments right. Right. and then we can do various experiments with them depending on what we want to study. Mm -hmm. uh, so how fast, how close to the speed of light do you get with these particles? So with the main injector we are something like 99.99975% of the speed of light. Not to be too precise, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we get very close, very, very and, close. and to get a little bit closer to the speed of light, uh, add a few nines there. That's when you need to build something like the Large Hadron Collider in, mm -hmm. in Europe, and that one is 17 miles in circumference. So, and so ours these is two are, and a half, right? Th this yeah. is these are big machines. Yes. Yeah. So when you get to that speed, that close to the speed of light, don't you run into relativistic effects where at the speed of light things are changing, you know, I mean, the, the, 
what was it, Einstein's experiment there, that, that the, the actual size of something will change as it accelerates, right? So, I mean, I'm sure you, you guys are scientists. I'm sure you've <laughs> thought of that. Um, but uh, how do you compensate? I mean, how do you work all that stuff in so that you aren't misled? So, so you, you need to work at a scale where it's precision with uh, making the timing right at the level of nanoseconds and the uh, calculations, it's not your, your high school math <laughs> anymore, right. so it's a little right. more complicated. So yes, so we, we need to take that into account. And then we see effects like, like what you said, uh, special relativ relativity, where particles that, that move fast, they live longer. We, we can actually hmm. see that in the laboratory effects where if you produce something that is at rest, it, it uh, disintegrates and decays quickly. But if we put it into the ring and make it go faster, it actually lives, say, 200 times longer or something like that. So it would be nice to be able, as a human being, to move <laughs> yeah. fast all the time and live longer, <laughs> right? right? Live longer. <laughs> live 200 times as long. Right. Yeah. yeah, I'd have a 200 times as many bills to pay. I think yeah. <laughs> that might be a problem. Um, so uh, what I'm always astonished by is the amount of science that goes into it. And I know that it's incremental. It builds over generations, you know, people build on the work, work of others. Right. Um, but the level, when you talk about the level of calculation that, that's involved, uh, how do you get there? I mean, how do you bring in the right minds? How do you get them working together in the right manner? A and how do you make these advances? It seems there's part of it that seems like just magic, that you can actually do it. It is really every generation of scientists builds upon the fin foundation created by the previous generation. So, so that's the old example with the textbooks and so on, but in our case it's scientific publications and, and then the senior scientists train, train the younger scientists and technology progresses hmm. uh, with, with computers and everything and programs, a lot of things are being written in computer programs uh, and, and they evolve constantly and constantly and, and the new generation picks up where, where the previous scientists left left off and, and fine tune it. So and it's an industry the same with mm, car yeah. technology or yeah, something sure. like that. Um, but what I always find amazing, uh, I myself I, I grew up in Germany. <coughs> uh, this field of science brings together people from all over the world. And at Fermilab, we are these days collaborating with scientists from 52 countries. And that is probably the true miracle <laughs> that having people from all these different cultures and languages mm. and, and so on working together and, and making it all work. And, and people, when we build our experiments, people build things in, in uh, Asia, in, in Europe, in uh, South America ship it to the United States and, and we put it all together and, and then it works. And that is perhaps maybe the <laughs> biggest Well, I was going to say, that that's the magic part, that <laughs> then it works part. <laughs> it, because the, the technology um, or the mechanics of it seems so daunting. As you talk, the, you know, there's um, a tremendous amount of room for error here. And the slightest error can cause the thing to fail. And, and so being able to develop that level of preci precision and being able to build the, the equipment that accomplishes that um, I think is, is equally astonishing. I know that's, that's the difference between what theoretical physicists and, and experimental, experimental physicists, yeah. right? The experimental guys actually build this stuff, right? <laughs> um, which I, to my mind, I think is even more astonishing than the theory because it's so easy to get it wrong. Not that theory can't be wrong too, but that's why I find astonishing. Um, how to many be fair, we should also mention there are a lot of engineers and technicians mm. and, and lots of other professions yeah. that help us mm. accomplish this. Definitely. So, so it, it's a big team effort. Mm -hmm. People who know how to like run wiring, for example. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. That sort of thing. And computer yeah. scientists. Yeah, you know. Computer scientists. So yeah. important. Absolutely. How much has um, the emergence of, of AI, artificial intelligence, uh, influenced what you do out there? That is a rather hot field the, these days. Uh, when it comes to the data analysis, uh, we think there's great potential to use that, to use new algorithms, pattern recognition, and so mm -hmm. on. Uh, lots of things you, you need the human brain to, to come to conclusions and so on, but uh, other processes you can automate, and, and we are dealing with data samples uh, that, that creates uh, billions of particle collisions and, and you cannot have you humans look at that. every single one so, right. so, so you need an automated uh, process. Yeah. Uh, 
But there are things like uh, talking about neural networks and mm -hmm. artificial intelligence where we can optimize uh, the algorithms of computers to help us and, and do amazing things. To at least point you in the right direction so that now human brains can start to interpret what's being flagged essentially yep. by these AI algorithms. Right? Correct. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't mean to oh, <laughs> ignore gosh, you. No, don't worry about it. <laughs> um, uh, but we talked a little earlier also about um, neutrinos, which is one of these subjects that most people know nothing about. And <laughs> you mention it and people think, what is that? Right. And why do I care? But now uh, Fermi Lab is, uh, because you mentioned one of the leaders in studying neutrinos. Mm -hmm. So um, what are they and why do we care? <laughs> so uh, neutrinos are uh, the most abundant matter particle in the universe. They are literally everywhere. There are trillions of them going through you right now and they have been your whole life and you haven't even noticed. Um, they are uh, so light and so difficult to detect that it was 60 years ago or so that we discovered that they exist at all. Um, and uh, so within those six decades, we've been trying to learn as much as we can about them because they're everywhere in the universe. They, they make up, uh, th the three different types of neutrinos that we know of are, are three of the 12, you know, the leptons and quarks mm -hmm. that we, they, they must be pretty important. They must have some role to play in the universe and how it works. And we just don't know what that is at the moment. So we're trying to figure out more about their properties, more about uh, how they interact with everything else. Uh, and uh, hopefully that will help us figure out some of the big questions that we have about the universe. So the answer is, we don't know. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, yeah. y that's, that's one of my favorite things. I work in communications. I'm not yeah. a scientist. But yeah. one of my favorite things about working at the laboratory is that you talk to any of the scientists for any length of time, and, and eventually you'll get to, I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know at all, uh -huh. which is why they come to work. You know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's that, that sort of passion to figure out these, these um, seemingly unsolvable questions with, you know, uh, brilliant theories and, and incredible experiments. In fact, it's one of the things that uh, I also find fascinating about, about scientists is where that, that edge of the known, or even the edge of the knowable, mm -hmm. uh, lies. Um, so where do, you, you know, where do you find that you can't determine things, like all the un uncertainty principles, you know, like all that stuff where you can't know two qualities or two factors at the same time? Um, and, and where does that leave you in, in, your, in your study? So here we are with neutrinos. And, and we don't even know, I'm guessing, we may not even know which questions to ask yet. Mm -hmm. Is yeah. that fair to say? Yeah, so the, the person who discovered or, or theorized neutrinos, Wolfgang Pauli, I mean, that's what he said when he theorized them was, I've come up with a particle that can never be detected. <laughs> and, and he was wrong. We, you know, we've, we've found a way to, to detect not the particle itself, but what happens when that particle hits something else. We found a way to to detect the effects of that particle, and so that's what we're using now to uh, to try to figure out everything else about it. Um, one of the big mysteries of neutrinos that we're trying to solve is that we know that there are three different kinds of them. We've seen three different kinds, and we also know over longer distances that they change from one kind to another. Um, it's like they they leave the accelerator in a minivan and they arrive where they're going in a sports car, and we have no idea how that happened. So we're trying to figure that out. You or know. why. Right. Or why? <laughs> well, yeah, but uh, it's the how that we really, you know, we're trying to figure out how th what this process and this mechanism and what it is. And one of the big questions we're trying to answer with that is um, why anything exists at all. Um, uh, shortly after the Big Bang, there should have been equal amounts of matter and antimatter, and they should have canceled each other out. Um, neutrinos, um, if, they, if their antiparticle behaves differently, um, might give us some clue as to why that is, you know, why, why matter dominated over anything else. Um, because we exist, we're here. Matter obviously, you know, <laughs> matter obviously won. So we're trying to figure out why that is. Uh, and, and we think neutrinos might give us a, a, a hint towards that. Now, I think we have a, a photo here of um, a neutrino experiment that you guys are getting. Uh, Mm -hmm. gonna, uh, yeah, so the, the biggest on, uh, project that we are working on now is called the Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment. And it's, a, it's an experiment that uh, virtually everything we're doing in neutrino research is leading towards. Mm -hmm. It's the largest um, particle physics experiment ever built in the United States. Uh, we will be uh, using our accelerator at Fermilab to send a beam of particles, which you can see now, mm -hmm. uh, through the Earth, 800 miles, and they go right through the Earth. They're, so there's no tunnel. It's right. Just, just beam just, them they, the they hardly ever interact with anything. So yeah. they'll go right through the Earth to a gigantic detector that we're building about a mile beneath the surface in a, a, an underground research lab in South Dakota. Uh, so that is going to take us the next 10 or so years to build. 
and then once it is operational, it will, it will hopefully uh, tell us, uh, the answer some of these questions that we have about neutrinos and how they change. We have for about a dozen years, a little bit more, been sending uh, neutrinos to northern Minnesota, where we have... Uh, a, because a, there's a shortage there and they need... Right, exactly. Supply, they, right. They <laughs> desperate cry for neutrinos right, in right. northern Minnesota. Um, but we have a very large uh, particle detector there called NOVA, and um, we've been, we're sending neutrinos uh, there all the time. And over doing over over the the dozen or so years that we we've been doing that with with Nova and its predecessor experiment, we discovered that 500 miles is you know it's a pretty good distance, but 800 miles is probably just about right to get the maximum you know data that we can get out of this oscillation out, out of this change. And so this experiment, the Deep Underground Neutrino experiment, is is 800 miles from the the accelerator to the detector, and so it's going to give us exactly what we need. We think. So how do you fund these kinds of major projects? Where does that money come from? So in, in this case, this Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment, uh, it, it's an international collaboration. So we have uh, uh, international partners, we have scientists at institutions in 32 countries that collaborate with us, and uh, a big partner is the European Laboratory CERN. Mm -hmm. uh, CERN has agreed to provide uh, equipment and, and technologies that we will use in, in South Dakota to build things. Uh, on the uh, United States side, it's a Department of Energy mm -hmm. uh, that provides resources. So uh, the United Kingdom has already signed up. India, uh, th there's uh, preparations for agreements with other European countries mm -hmm. and, and uh, also in South America. So it is an international uh, project from the get-go, and it's it's actually the largest international science project ever hosted by the United States. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah, yeah. That's really that's good to hear that. <laughs> in an era where cooperation seems to be failing, mm -hmm. it's nice to see something actually go in the other direction. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, I assume, though, that, that there's a, a constant lobbying effort. You have to go to Washington every year and get budget for it. I mean, uh, is, does Fermi play uh, a role in that kind of political process as well, trying to make sure the funding stays put? Or is, it, is there something that was put in place at the beginning that says we're definitely going to fund this till it's done? So in this case, in, in this uh, project, uh, we have strong support from the U.S. Congress, uh, from the Department of Energy. Uh, so, so we are on, on track with our uh, project, mm -hmm. the schedule. The funding is allocated, and, and that is something that's how the U.S. government works. The funding is allocated year right. by year. Yes. So in, in, in principle, Congress every year can decide, okay, you get more money, less money, or something like that. Uh, but the Department of Energy, with its international partners, has worked out uh, the funding profile mm -hmm. for the project. The whole project for construction is about eight years now. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we are two years in into this, this funding profile and we are on track, and we hope we stay on, on track. So. <laughs> yes, I'll cross my fingers on that. <laughs> Having spent a lot of time with government, I know how that funding process can work or not. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, also, uh, what people may not know is the Fermilab is open to the public, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so talk a little bit about uh, what the public can see. Sure, uh, yeah, um, we are open every day, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, during By the, the way, we have uh, we have some uh, photos oh, up here too. We don't, okay. don't want to miss these. Oh, this is right. a, another experiment. Absolutely, yeah. So one of the things that we uh, we do we do a lot of cosmic research, um, mm -hmm. looking at dark matter and dark energy, um, and this these are shots from a uh, experiment that we do called the Dark Energy Survey. Um, we are the lead lab on that experiment, and. Um, it uh, basically is a, a very strong digital camera. It's a 560, I think, megapixel digital camera. Your phone's about 20. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and right. we uh, mounted that camera on a telescope in Chile, and then it can see 8 billion light years away and capture it in digital quality. And so we've been spending the last five and a half years taking data of that whole, uh, this region of sky um, where, um, uh, the, um, we're, we're capturing these really amazing photographs of, uh, of space. And we're going to be using that data over a, a, a number of years to try to figure out more about dark energy, which we think is this force that's pushing the universe apart faster and faster. So the universe is expanding. That expansion is accelerating. We don't know why. Uh, we think it's dark energy, and we'd like to figure out more and about that. dark energy by its nature is dark. Is dark, can't yeah. can't see it, right? So dark matter and dark energy are just yeah. names that were made up, you know, because we it's can't. Because we don't yeah, know what it is. We don't know what it is, and we can't detect it. So, so. sort of like neutrinos. 
sort of, <laughs> except we can, you know, we can. At least detect those. Right, right yeah. We know that those are, 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 are out there. Yeah. And, and for a while, scientists thought that neutrinos may actually be the solution to the dark matter problem, mm. but, but they are not. There, there must be other particles out there that may be somewhat similar to neutrinos, but on the other hand, must also be very different from neutrinos. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so Fermilab is, is really learning about matter, energy, space and time, how the universe works, why you and I are, are here and mm -hmm. exist. So, so, so this is the wrestling with the very fundamental questions yes. of science, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And developing the technologies and really cutting edge technologies mm -hmm. from particle accelerators, from computing, mm -hmm. from imaging technologies, all, all these things to, to build the instruments to, to solve these, these questions. So let's come back. I know we had a picture up a minute ago about um, uh, this is uh, what, family day. Yeah. So every year we do a family open house. It's in February usually, mm -hmm. and we get 3,000 or so people, uh, mostly families, to, to come out and uh, do hands-on science activities and get tours of the laboratory. That's only one of the things that we do throughout the year. We have public events that, that happen all the time. We have an arts and lecture series where we bring in, um, oh, and we you also bring have, in, You bring course, in bison to yes, lecture. Yes. We have a herd right. of bison that, right, uh, right. that uh, people can come see. So uh, every year uh, we have uh, baby bison and we have 14 <laughs> this year and they're absolutely adorable and so people uh, people bring their families and their young kids in to uh, to come see uh, to come see the bison but, but you don't have to go on family day to, to no see the absolutely bison. any day they want so we're open every day 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. during the summer months 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. during the winter month and um, we have a strong education department that's in virtually every school in our area and uh, brings in school groups and does tours with them, uh, does uh, education uh, events, does classes, does a f a, an outdoor fair every year. Uh, we have an arts and lecture series uh, which brings uh, people in, uh, lecturers and, and musicians and performers from all over the world to, to, um, to perform on the Fermilab stage and the public can come see that. Um, all of this stuff is on our website, which is fnal.gov. Say that again, FNAL. F-N-A-L dot G-O-V. Fermi National Accelerated Laboratory. You got it. <laughs> yeah, but uh, we, uh, we have a, a, a very good relationship, I, I think, with our, our, uh, our neighbors. And um, that's been developed over the, the five decades that we've been in existence. And so we like, to, we like to keep it that way. So we like to give our neighbors, uh, uh, you know, give back as much as we can to the, to the people who, who uh, support us throughout. Yeah, and there's never been a uh, not in my backyard kind of uh, problem out there. In right, sure. In Batavia, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so just uh, we only have about a minute and a half left, but in that time, I I wanted to come back to something you just said a minute a minute ago that we thought that neutrinos might have been the dark matter that we were looking for. Um, what changed our minds? So doing experiments and mm -hmm. and measuring what we see in the universe, what we learned about how heavy neutrinos are, and and these things. And it all didn't add up, so mm -hmm. we are still missing a big chunk of, of what the universe is made of. Which I find astonishing that, you know, as much as we think we're at the forefront of human knowledge, and I guess we are compared to the past, um, there's so much more. In fact, there's a part of um, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe that says as, as soon as we have figured out what the universe looks like, the universe itself immediately changes mm -hmm. and becomes something far more complex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the more you know, the more you know you don't know. So, yes. yeah. yeah, which is uh, one, of the, uh, one of the challenges that you guys face mm -hmm. every day, right? And, uh, and that's why, in fact, Fermilab is there, right? To yeah. wrestle with those very basic questions. Absolutely. Um, well, Andre, uh, I'm so glad to have both of you here. So. Um, Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. It was Kurt. a pleasure. I, I knew I had that right at yeah. the tip of my tongue. So, <laughs> Kurt and Andre. Yes, thank you so much for being here. I always learn a lot when you guys uh, come and tell me about well, what's going come, on. Come visit us. Absolutely. Open to the public. Open Absolutely, everything. we'll yeah. do that. And thank you for joining us once again for Public Perspective. I'm your host, Kevin McDermott. You can find us every Saturday night at 8 on Comcast Channel 19 or see us on the web at publicperspective.tv. So, until next time, thank you and good night.